Hi, wild things. Do you have kids? Do you know any kids? Or are you just a big kid yourself? Then boy, have I got some exciting news for you. I am no longer just a podcaster. I am an author, and my very first book is coming out on October 11th, The Search for Sasquatch, a middle-grade nonfiction book based on the first season of Wild Thing, is coming your way. It's a beautiful hardcover book with full-color illustrations. It's also an audiobook, narrated by yours truly. They're available for pre-order right now, and you're probably going to want to get a copy of both. To pique your curiosity, here's a sneak peek, or is it a sneak listen, of the introduction. Introduction. Nests. Screak! 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 Whip-like bendy branches scraped down the sides of our giant black pickup truck like a witch's fingernails. I tried not to lose my lunch as we bounced along a bumpy gravel logging road in the hinterlands of Washington's Olympic Peninsula. Just as I rolled down the window to get some fresh air, Shane Corson, my bearded mountain man guide, pulled to a stop in front of a padlocked steel gate. I looked around, not sure if this was the right place. We were in the middle of nowhere. But Shane killed the engine, hopped out of the truck, and fished a key from his pocket. The giant lock popped open, and Shane loosened the chain so he could swing the gate wide. This was it! I suddenly got so excited that I forgot how barfy I'd just felt. We were about to go deep into a patch of tangled woods and towering spruce trees to see something that was off-limits to, well, just about everyone. Shane hopped back into the driver's seat, sporting an ear-to-ear grin. It's not much further up the road, he said clearly feeling as excited as I was about what he planned to show me. We inched forward through the thickening underbrush, and a few bumpy minutes later, we had gone as far as the truck could take us. We had to hoof it from there. I'd met Shane about a year ago on a camping trip in Oregon, but I didn't really get to know him until a few months later, because that first time, he wasn't too excited about talking to me. Why? Well, let me introduce myself. My name is Laura, and I'm a journalist. My job is asking lots of questions and writing about what I learn for others to read. Sometimes that can make the people I talk to pretty nervous, especially if they think someone is going to make fun of them and their ideas and beliefs. And Shane? I think he felt particularly worried because of one very specific interest. Bigfoot. That's right. I said Bigfoot. Sasquatch himself. Now. If you've never heard of Bigfoot before, picture an enormous ape-like creature that's 10 feet tall and might weigh as much as 1,000 pounds. It's covered in hair, walks on two feet, like us, and leaves giant footprints behind. Or at least that's what we think it looks like. There are lots of fascinating and terrifying stories about Bigfoot from people who claim to have seen or heard it although no one has ever been able to show any real scientifically acceptable proof. But Shane swore that what was hidden out there in the woods could help make the case for Bigfoot. I jumped down from the truck, perfumed myself with big spritzes of bug spray, and tightened the laces on my hiking boots. Then I straightened up and followed Shane into the wall of shrubs and blooming rhododendron bushes. As we plunged through the underbrush, Shane kept a brisk pace, He clearly knew where he was going, while I seriously struggled to keep up. Behind me, the truck disappeared. Geez, I thought to myself, I hope I don't have to find my own way back. Huckleberry brambles caught on my clothes and left red, raised scratches down my arm. It all looked so beautiful and wild, but I didn't have any time to take in the scenery. Then Shane disappeared down a steep slope, and I lost sight of him for a second. I stopped still. It was dead quiet. I couldn't even hear him moving anymore. Just as I started to worry, I pushed through another thick wall of shrubs and found him standing quietly at the base of some trees. He looked at me and then looked down. Here we are. This is it, he drawled, ho-hum, like it was no big deal. He moved a little bit farther and gestured at the ground. I looked to where he was pointing and my jaw dropped. If I had been trying to play the part of a calm and unflappable reporter, I had just failed. Whoa! I exclaimed, not at all professionally. This wasn't what I had expected, 
but it was definitely what I'd hoped for. This is... this is crazy! We stood in front of a pile of intertwined sticks and branches, woven together so carefully that they looked like they'd been made into a giant nest. It was at least eight feet across, so big that I could have comfortably lain down in it. I could even have stretched out. In fact, Shane had already done this himself when he came out here before. It felt like a mattress, he said with a grin. I felt small, very small. It truly looked like a bird's nest. It could have been a bird's nest. But of course, as far as I knew, no bird on the planet made nests that size. And that wasn't the only nest either. Shane pointed out six others nearby, hidden between clumps of trees, with a few small ones tucked into low branches. He said there were others, too, but farther away and a little harder to get to. You would have been amazed when we first came down here, he said, obviously pleased with my reaction. Three years ago, when we first saw these, they looked even better then. These weren't just slapped together. The we, he referred to, was the Olympic Project, a Bigfoot research group Shane belongs to. A few years ago, the man who owns this land found the nests when he was out inspecting the trees on his property. They confused him, so he asked the Olympic Project to come take a look at them, 21 in all, to see if they could puzzle out what had made them. Shane, who had spent his life hunting and fishing and camping, knew that these nest things were really unusual. It's not a bear bed or an elk bed or a deer bed. He scraped at a tree, pulling off bits of loose bark and gathering it, along with dead leaves, small branches, and other debris into a loose, sloppy pile. That's what a bear bed looks like. But these are nests, and in all my years, I've never come across anything like this, he said. They look more like gorilla nests than anything else. Gorillas make nests? I asked myself. Later, I looked up gorilla nests online, and Shane was right. Gorillas do build giant nests, similar to this one. But there aren't any gorillas in this part of the world. Before I could ask more questions, Shane took off down the trail again, yelling back over his shoulder for me to keep up. Five minutes later, he screeched to a halt. He scanned the woods like he was lost. Oh no, we're lost, and some giant nest-building thing is out here with us, I thought to myself. Then he wrapped his hand around the branch of a nearby huckleberry bush and showed me the end of it. It had been broken off. I looked at him blankly. I didn't get it. Then he showed me another branch, and another, and another, all the same. These huckleberry branches have all been snapped and their leaves stripped clean to make these nests. There are no teeth marks. Something had to have hands to snap it off. Strong hands. Because some of these branches are a couple of inches thick. You can't just break something like that in half, he pointed out. I gave it a try. It would have taken someone, or something, much stronger than I was to do it. And that nest we just saw was piled high with those branches. What did it all add up to? Something with the strength to break thick branches. Something that makes nests. Something that likes the solitude of the woods. So I was not the teeniest bit surprised when Shane finally said what we'd both been thinking. That maybe, and it was a big maybe, Bigfoot made these nests. We're not saying it's definitely Sasquatch, Shane said. We're saying we don't know what made these nests. They're unknown nests with unknown hair mixed in with the foliage and unknown animal behavior behind it. The goal is to get to the bottom of the mystery. I knew Shane leaned toward the possibility of Bigfoot, but he wanted to be careful. For starters, they still didn't have the right kind of evidence to prove it. And Shane also knew that most of the world thought Bigfoot was nothing more than a big joke, a myth. He'd been laughed at by enough people that he didn't tell just anyone about his interest. And even though I wasn't sure Bigfoot was real, I had started to understand how people ended up tromping around in the woods looking for evidence. Then Shane said something that was super important and reminded me why I came all the way out here into the middle of nowhere. Something made these. Maybe we can't say for sure that Bigfoot made them, but these things are weird. Why wouldn't we want to ask questions? Asking questions, that's the point of all this. Because I was standing in front of something I couldn't explain, and while part of me felt a little silly about being there, I mostly just wanted to find out more. I mean, I'm a journalist. It's kind of my job. But I also felt really curious. What is Bigfoot? 
What do we know about this creature? Why are there so many sightings and so little proof? Why are all the photos that we do have so blurry? I had no idea if I'd find Sasquatch or, well, some other explanation, but I wanted to get to the bottom of the Bigfoot phenomenon. While we had been talking, we'd hiked back to the nest site. Shane bent over and looked more closely at a section of the nest where a wedge, like a big fat slice of pizza, had been removed. I wasn't the only visitor he'd brought out here. A few months back, a scientist came to collect samples of the nest, hoping to gather clues about this mystery in the woods. Clearly, a lot of other people also had questions, and I wasn't sure any of us knew what we were going to find. That was the introduction to the first Wild Thing book, The Search for Sasquatch, produced by Foxtopus Inc. in partnership with Abrams Kids. It's available starting October 11th, and you can pre-order the audiobook and the hardcover right now. Go to wildthingpodcast.com for more information.